Hello, everybody. Uh, we are now recording. This is the beginning of a new series of meetups about large language models in the closure community. Some of this will be very much general and useful for other tech communities, but sometimes it will be about closure too. And uh, here we also have a few of the uh, presenters of the coming meetups we'll have in the coming few weeks. And first, thank you so much, Martinas, for being able to, to prepare a talk on such a short notice and just create this beginning for us. And, uh, you know, the, this topic is something that is troubling for a few of us. We are actually concerned and, and it is not an easy topic, and, but certainly we need to learn. And, and I think that's the idea. And probably after the recorded part, we at some point will stop recording and keep chatting for those who wish to stay and chat. And there is a lot to talk about and probably many feelings will arise. And, and for now, you know, let us just try to be kind because so many cultures, so many people of very different backgrounds are here. And so we are trying to create this new beginning of this group that will study together. And yeah, and maybe uh, we can begin by introducing ourselves. Anybody is invited to just say something brief and, you know, like uh, for a few seconds, just something you wish to share. Uh, so maybe if it makes sense, let us begin with uh, Irfan, if you wish to say something about yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, I'm Irfan, right now I'm in Tokyo as an economic graduate school student and uh, hopefully I will be able to present uh, in June with Daniel about from engineering. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, is it Ziki Mantas, would you like to say something? Yeah, hi, uh, Daniel. Thanks for, for inviting and gathering this group. Uh, it's really a pleasure to for me to present in what, two, two sessions? Uh, happy to do that. I've been working with Clojure, I don't know, 15 years since the version 1.1 one, one probably working in natural language processing mainly, search and around, and now gradually went into LLMs. Um, yeah, happy to meet you all. Um, uh, Peter, since you're just next to screen for me. Am I the only Peter here? No, there are more, but I take it. No, when I went to school, there were five Peters in my class. So it was very seldom me people talk about. But anyway, I'm Peter. Um, I um, I call myself an AI augmented developer these days. So I'm using uh, these LLMs uh, to to help me uh, with coding uh, a lot. And I'm, I'm super stoked about uh, listening to here. Maybe I could even try try to use. LLMs um, from my more directly if I get to know stuff about that here. So that's what I, why I thank you for having introduced Daniel. Should I pick the next? Yeah, why not? Well, then I take Ian. Thank you, Peter. Um, name's Ian. I work for Flexiana. Um, a, a closure based company. Uh, been using closure professionally for about four years and playing with it for 12, I think now. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that and pass it on to um, Sergey. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sergey. Been doing software engineer for uh, many years, uh, but last um, seven years or so, mostly in cybersecurity. So uh, our conversation today is very interesting for me because I'm building the uh, a tool for a content generation for cybersecurity, which combines like classic AI approach, um, you know, schema based, rule based, and I'm looking into using LLMs for uh, one of the steps that um, uh, can be a bit less transparent. So the way I can introduce a bit of uh, neural net uh, flavor. Um, yeah, billions enclosure, of course. Um, 
that's it for me. And the next one, maybe Eric, Eric Scott. Uh, hi, I'm in uh, San Diego. Uh, I did, uh, I've been doing closure for a long time and before that a lot of common lisp. Uh, I uh, was doing a fair amount of machine learning uh, back in the aughts uh, before the, uh, the, the neural net uh, deep learning uh, uh, revolution really uh, caught on. Uh, the last decade or so, I've mainly been interested in uh, knowledge graphs and ontologies and the like. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, recent uh, um, work in uh, 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 large language models is uh, quite compelling. So I'm uh, I'm here to just kind of look in and uh, uh, see what I can uh, 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 learn uh, about uh, about this technology. Uh, why don't I go to uh, um, Ziggy Mantas? Yeah, that's me. Uh, I, ju I just went. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. You were you were no, a small that. thumbnail. Yeah. How about Olaf? Oh, you're, you're, yeah. Oh no, Olaf, you're muted. Yeah, thank you, Olaf. Yeah, so after you fix it, then it will be good to hear you too. Yeah, and maybe uh, Andres, would you like to say something about yourself? Uh, yes, hello, thank you. Um, so I'm, I started software development a, a few years ago uh, from doing mostly social sciences before. And I discovered Clojure through a work. I started, uh, I've been doing Clojure for about two years now. Uh, and I'm kind of curious and ambivalent about uh, LLMs and all the AI hype that's going on. So, so I'm very curious to to see how it's being used and and, and curious about how it's being done with closure and and that's that's me. Um, maybe I'll pass it to Irfan. Did I pronounce it correctly? Uh, yes. Thank you, Andres. <laughs> Actually, I've already. Uh spoken so maybe next one is uh, maybe mr sal hey uh, hi everyone um i'm out of los angeles i've joined some of the uh site closure groups once in a while here and there during covid um but uh, new to closure somewhat right i've used it a little bit here and there uh interested to know you know what the community is up to with all the hype around LLM and what we are doing. And maybe that's the way for me to get into closure again, because, you know, I try to get in and out, uh, but it never sticks for me somehow. But hopefully I'm hoping here to hang around and do all these sessions in uh, June and see where it goes. And thanks, Daniel and group for organizing this. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, by the way, I'm Daniel. I usually do statistics, and nowadays I'm a community organizer in the SciClosure community, which is about data and science in closure. Um, Mitesh, hello, would you like to say something about yourself? Hey, Daniel, yeah, sure. Um, I'm from the Gaivan slash Lambda Island team, and we also maintain the Majorians log and the Closure Wars. Uh, so I saw some chatter around using Luzurian's log data and kind of interested about LLMs in general. So kind of excited to learn more today. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you so much. And Marius, hello. Would you like to say something? Hello, uh, Marius. I'm from Flexiana as a Yen. And... I'm currently working on a cryptocurrency project, but uh, I already worked on a recommender system as well before. So uh, I may have interest into data science as well. 
Uh, that's it, everyone has talked. Sorry, I was disconnected a moment. I don't Thank know. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, Gozal, Gozal, would you like to say something? Hi, my name is Gozal. Um, also work in Closure and happy to be here. Thank you so much. Um, Jose? Hello, my, my name is Jose Javier. Um, my background is in political science, uh, history, and sociology. Um, I've been doing software development for two years now, mainly JavaScript. And I've been doing closure. Well, I've been learning closure for about three years. I haven't had the chance to do closure professionally. And I'm interested in LLMs since. I would like to uh, make something like a chat that uh, feeds some on, on, a, on a certain data set. For for example, the oof of Nicolas Luhmann, the, the German sociologist, and uh, it will be something like a net score system able to uh, answer questions about Luhmann's oof. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, hello, Oscar, would you like to say something, Oscar? Yes, uh, hello, uh, I'm uh, Oscar, uh, working for, uh, for Metascene. I've uh, been software developer for, for two years uh, using uh, Clojure for, uh, uh, during that time. Uh, I'm interested in Netherlands uh, mainly to kind of enhance my uh, development work uh, and, and also uh, kind of uh, perhaps lower barriers uh, with the other uh, related uh, roles to uh, software software engineers. So that's uh, all. Thanks. Uh. Thank you so much. Hello, Blaine. Hi, I'm Blaine Moores. I'm in uh, Oklahoma City. I'm a uh, biochemistry professor, and I've been uh, participating in the side coach community for about a year and a half. And like Saul, I've been uh, trying to uh, spin up uh, uh, with closure uh, uh, several times. Uh, I found the lib Python um, library uh, one way to get into closure coming from Python. And uh, I'm, um, we have, uh, looks like uh, LLMs will be uh, utilized in classrooms in the upcoming uh, uh, school year. So I need to get on board with them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. Um, Eric? Oh, you, you have spoken already. Yes, I think I already oh, yeah. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. And uh, Lalit? Hello. Uh, hey, hi. So, hi. I'm a professional software developer uh, working in Bangalore. And I have, like, I'm working in this field for like eight years. I have worked with Closure for my hobby projects. Uh, like a couple of them and like not, not too professionally and not for uh, bigger projects or something, but yeah, I work bo both in front end and back end enclosure for my hobby projects. And I was curious like uh, about this LLM and cyclage thing. So yeah, I j just wanted to see how it's being used or what is the status of this thing. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, hello, Dan. Would you like to say something? Sure. Uh, my name is Dan Boitnot. Um, I'm a developer for, I guess, 23 years or 26 years now, actually. Um, and I've been using Clojure over the last few years. And my current project is a sort of um, a workflow engine that is looking to use uh, an LLM as part of its guidance and with a focus on the ability for user managed and augmented uh, pro automated processing. And thank you so much. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, but did you wish to say anything? Uh, oh, no, sorry. Um, uh, Peter Chan. So oh, Peter Chan, uh, if you wish to say anything, then you're on mute. 
and maybe I'll, I'll ask you again soon. Hello, Tori, would you like to say something, Tori? Yeah, so I am a closure developer at Brigham Young University, BYU, and I work in the digital humanities where people have already mentioned how LLMs are making a big splash in education. So I want to learn more about how we can use them and understand them, especially with closure. Thank you so much. Uh, Tim, hello. Uh, hi, I'm Tim. Uh, I'm a software engineer uh, in New York. Um, I've been a software engineer for maybe 20 years, worked professionally in Clojure for about four. Um, uh, I'm interested in LLMs and AI in general. I think you could probably put me in the AI skeptic uh, part of the column. Um, I feel like there's been a lot of hype around LLMs. Uh, but really, I'm just here to learn more about them. Um, and I'm also interested in the kind of intersection between uh, kind of humanities, literature, and AI. Thank you. Uh, Mark, hello, would you like to say something? Is this me? Uh, yeah. Oh, hi. So there is another Marco here. Oh, uh, I'm so sorry, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for organizing this, first of all. Uh, so yeah, I'm, um, I work at Hotstarts. We do um, dig digitizing of the streams, basically create actual usable data from video. Um, yeah, we're doing some machine learning stuff and uh, I'm looking into LLMs to see how I can squeeze in more closure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, and now I'll ask, the other Mark, if you wish to say something. Uh, is that is that me, Mark? Yeah, yes. Okay, just check in. <laughs> All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Lamott. I am in Austin, Texas. I've been doing uh, closure professionally for uh, about 12 years, 12 or 13 years. I uh, started as a data engineer with Caspalog. That was my first introduction to closure. Uh, so now I am a CTO at a tech startup in the design and building architecture space. Um, but we just got our uh, closed our Series A last week. Um, who had previous VC funding before that, but um, just got a new round last week. Uh, so pretty excited about that. And um, uh, what? So I'm looking at LLM, uh, you know, uh, you know, various technologies and AI um, to see if they can help in making some of the decisions around design and architecture. Um, I played around with Langchain, which is a, a popular Python tool um, through CLJ Python, um, which was kind of interesting. Um, Chris Nuremberger's, I think his name is, is uh, the guy who wrote that. Um, it gives access to Python. There's a lot of tools and stuff going on in Python. Um, but you know, if I don't have to do that translation from Python, uh, so much the better. If I could do stuff directly from Clojure, so much the better. Uh, that's it for me. Yeah, thank you and congrats and best wishes. And, Thank you. Uh, hello, Brad. Would you like to say something? Hi. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Brad Lucas. I'm in New York. Uh, I've used Clojure on and off for a number of years, and I'm a real fan of the language. I'm here to learn more about you know how Clojure is being used for machine learning, and specifically LLM LLMs. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, hello, Benjamin. Hi, uh, super nice to be here. First time joining live. Uh, I'm uh, also been doing development for uh, about 30 years, but uh, relatively new to Clojure. Um, did a, a stunt uh, last year uh, within the generative space without it being AI. And now it just seems obvious that you can't do generation without having AI. And Closure seems to be uh, the, the, the right mix of expressivity and predictability. So super excited, excited to see uh, what we're gonna see today. Um, I can maybe add by saying that uh, uh, also inspired by LangChain and uh, looking to see what we can do in the closure space that does something similar. Thank you. Yeah, and um, maybe Olaf, would you like to try again to say something if you wish? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you now. Hello, nice Hello. to meet everyone. Nice to meet you. I've been doing, uh, yeah, I'm uh, 
working for a closure company for about two years and i'm in uh in norway and yeah i'm uh, excited to learn about llm enclosure so nice to meet everyone thank you so much yeah and i'm just checking uh a few other let's join i think only duminda remains so if you wish to say something anything to Minda, hey yeah hi thanks uh, thanks for organizing this uh i've been uh, I've been a software engineer for about 12 years, uh, doing closure for the last five years on and off, and nothing serious, uh, not professionally. And I've, uh, I've tried my hand at uh, some stuff with LLMs and LangChain, Pinecone, all that stuff, but it seems uh, it's polluted with Python only. So I, I tried uh, using closure a little bit, but um, didn't seem like there's a straight way through. So I'm excited to see what you guys have to say about that. Uh, anyway, uh, looking forward to hearing Martina's view on uh, like in about AIs in general and what he thinks is gonna happen in this space, uh, except the technical part. Thanks. I'm not saying what's going to happen, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Fantastic. I think we haven't skipped anybody and please tell me if we have. And yeah, so in a moment we'll begin, finally begin Martina's uh, talk. Uh, I'll just share the screen briefly with the plan of the talks. And you see, we have this web page at the Cyclodge website and a few meetups are planned. And uh, this, is the current one, uh, the one which is the intro to LLMs. And then the two following ones will be in the middle of June. And both of them will be around the same weekend. And maybe we'll ask now Irfan and Ziki Mantas to say something about these two planned meetings. Uh, one will be about prompt engineering, the other one about uh, Bosquet. And yeah. Uh, would you like to add something, anything, Irfan, if you wish? Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, in the last three to four months, uh, I have been uh, using both uh, OpenAI uh, GPT and alternative uh, LL apps uh, in order to, uh, I'm actually in a pre-launch startup right now, based in Tokyo. Uh, we are trying to help other startups and small businesses use these LLMs to uh, increase their business uh, velocity. So we have been trying a lot of props to do this. And uh, hopefully uh, I will be able to show uh, how this kind of uh, prompt engineering can help uh, increase the ground truth of the model and uh, reduce the amount of hallucination that the, uh, LLM, the AI outputs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, and we are hoping to hear a little more about that on the meetup in the middle of June. And Ziki Mantas, would you like to say something about Bosquet and your talk? Yeah, so I will follow up with Bosquet. It's a closure library to work with LLMs. Uh, yeah, it's uh, someone Mark was mentioning, uh, Langchain. So broadly, we can think about it as, as, as a library in that direction. Uh, so I'll be presenting how I kind of uh, tried to solve uh, prompt, in, prompt engineering uh, issues, how to make it more, more repeatable, more constructible, more reusable. Uh, and uh, what I will be, I will also present different, a bit, present different Python tools in, in, in this area, compare them to that. And my goal out of a session would be to come from the community discussion to, to figure out where, in which directions to such closure tools need to be uh, developed, where, where is the best value for the open source community in, in tools like that, in LLM ops tools like this. So hopefully it will be useful uh, for those who don't want to go Python way with uh, lock, uh, Langchain, and also help me please discover where to bring it forward. Yeah, thanks. Looking forward. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now we have one remaining hour till the official time. And 
uh, we will pass the, uh, to the presentation by Martinas. And maybe Martinas, if you wish, you will tell us something also about the, the calendar project and, and all that. And, you know, thank you everybody for being here on very different hours and so on. And it is the beginning of something new. We are not experts, we are confused together and we will share our experiences in the coming meetings. And thank you, Martinas, for being able to create a beginning for everybody here. Okay, so thank you for, for this introduction. Thank you for everybody to, uh, to present themselves. I'm, I'm a software engineer. I think I have like seven or eight years of experience. Uh, three or four of them is in Clojure. And my previous project where I worked in was to design a database for a microservice platform. We used WebSockets and fancy stuff. And now I'm on vacation, as you see. <laughs> yeah, vacationing with, by doing this presentation. So I wanted to, to show my, uh, my uh, calendar, uh, which I developed for a Clojure event feed. Uh, so if you go to events in Clojure Slack, Clojure and Slack, uh, then you can see in here a pinned message which, which has this link. And in this link, you have this calendar, which also has this event of today. And in this event, you can see the description and the time. And additionally, uh, if you click about, then you have this uh, calendar link, which you can also find uh, which you can also find in the Slack, and I will show you in a moment. But what it does is you can, for example, add this link into your phone. And uh, this link is generated by Gerd Goet, and the calendar is updated by him. So every event from here is in, this, in that link. And this UI, this front end, is only displaying everything that comes from that link. So if I just reload and go to network, you see here that the events come over here. These are the events. That's all that this front end does. There is no tracking, there is no nothing, uh, and so on. And you can also, if you don't want to click this link, you can also take this link from here. I think you can just come, yeah. So if you want to find, if you don't want to click uh, add event every time, you can simply use this calendar in your phone or somewhere else if you want to, and then you can get all the events that you want. So that's, that's about that. So I think that now I will begin with my actual presentation. Um, so, so I will be talking about large language models. Uh, I'm not a pro in this uh, space. I'm just trying to learn as you all. So I'm a software engineer. My several jobs were in Clojure. Uh, I wrote a Tetris where I wrote a genetic algorithm to, for it to play itself. Uh, and then I also worked with data in a data science company with a future presenter, Jigimantas. Uh, and we were doing some uh, data analysis. I was not working on data analysis back then, but there are other important things that needed uh, that needs that need to be done before actual modeling and and uh, data analysis part can even begin. Also, I have a master's in computer science, which was about computer modeling. So I have a little bit of experience, but not not like crazy amounts. Uh, I will be going to talk about general level high level misconceptions misconceptions about the models that we have in the world, uh, not not uh, not only the not not hallucinations of the models. Uh, I will go about this later, but I will talk about what and how the models are de delivered to the world. Why some of them are like mm, not really too ethical. Let's say it this, this way. And then I will talk about theory about LSTM and LLM and transformers. And also I will give uh, an example, uh, some examples about what you can find right now. And then I will proceed with a demo where I will try to uh, present several models. Uh, some of them will be offline, some of them will be just GPT online. So 
what are we going what are we doing now so if you so during the past couple of weeks or maybe a month there was this craziness which actually uh, made developers sad so i met i met several developers who said that chat gpt and every development in this uh, in this re in this recent time was starting to make them sad because they don't know what they're going to do. And actually, I was there too. And I decided to, uh, to think, think more about what it, what it means and why, why am I sad. So in this presentation, I will try to uh, present several, uh, several problems with the models. And those problems may give you some of the answers that I got for, for, from, from thinking about the models. Because even though models are really good, uh, they may not be uh, they may not be mm, suitable for everything. So I think that this is what you could take from this presentation. So, for example, uh, talking about models not being good for everything. So one of you uh, mentioned that you want to enhance your uh, development workflow and enhance your uh, things that you work on. But the thing is that not every company is uh, allowing to use these models. And these models are not allowed to be used uh, based on concerns that, for example, could leak your inter intellectual pro property, property. So for example, if you are developing GPT-5, let's say <clears throat> in theory, then you would probably don't want to input uh, your, your research into GPT, into chat GPT, because probably you don't want chat GPT to be able to reason about this. So in that way, you know that some people who think about this, they are not going to enter it. But some people who don't care probably will enter. And that's why these bans are in place because you know that sometimes people are not going to, to listen to you unless you publicly announce that, hey, we're banning it. Um, also, I want to mention that OpenAI title is a little bit, at least a little bit misleading. So yes, before that it was a non-profit, but now it is a for-profit for and the, the the income, uh, the profit is capped at 10 times the investment. What it means is that uh, Microsoft invested $10 billion and they will expect to um, earn $100 billion. But it's really hard to even comprehend what it means. So AI, of course, it's AI company, but not it's not really open because it's uh, it's governed in the traditional way where people are actually closing the actual important stuff and uh, opening something that they just want to be open and uh, not more. And uh, OpenAI developed this codex model, which actually is a scrambler, but there are two lawsuits. One of them is about codex GitHub and OpenAI, and the other one is about uh, stable diffusion, open AI, and, uh, and image generation. So the lawsuits say that if you remove a license from a code that you put out, then it means that you are reusing that code, but you forgot to include the license. But the license says that even though your code is open source, you should not remove the license. So if there is no attribution, even if the code, if, even if the code is purely open source, and then it means that there is a problem. So, and of course, the, the, there are examples where code that doesn't, uh, code that is not open source ended up in that model. So these are examples are of course extreme and so on, but uh, they exist. So Microsoft and uh, OpenAI did a very bad job in the year. And as an AI community, uh, I know that, well, I'm not, I'm not AI community, but I know that this is a very big problem for 
AI as we know it, because when AI is produced, it never says how the data is uh, produced. It never says that, hey, I used all of this data, all of these chunks of data, uh, and that's why you have to use, for example, this license. It doesn't say that ever. It just says, hey, you inputted the number five. Now, and the problem is that you probably should add the license information, but for, for companies such as OpenAI, it's very, uh, they are, it's very convenient to omit this detail, let's say detail. So I have, I just wanted to mention it because this is a very big misconception about AI. And uh, oh yeah, so Microsoft invested 10 billion and what does this number mean? So I was trying to come up with some interesting uh, statistic that could, for example, be similar to this number. So in two years for from 2021, uh, this is the first post that was losing money. Uh, crypto crypto uh, lost $12.2 billion. So in two years, crypto lost $12 billion, but Microsoft casual invested 10 billion. So crypto scammers, you're slacking. Okay, so I think that uh, we could stop for a short amount of questions and then uh, proceed with the theory part. Uh, do, does anyone have any questions or no? No. Am I like very bad? <laughs> Maybe. So I have one question. Um, yeah. I recently got a, um, a message this morning, in fact, from uh, from my VC, from my investor. Um, and he was uh, talking about this anecdote at um, uh, uh, at GitHub, uh, you know, where they're, you know, touting the, the significance of like um, GitHub uh, Copilot, uh, saying something mm -hmm. like 25% uh, of, um, you know, their developers are accepting 25% of the Copilot recommendations. Uh, do you, you know, do you, do you sort of buy this? I think the implication here is that like they're reducing their workload by 25% and, and I've seen other people proclaiming, you know, productivity improvements of 30% for their engineers. Uh, does that seem at all reasonable to you? Um, yesterday, I, I want to mention one comment that uh, I have read yesterday when people were commenting about these AI problems. One person commented that um, if AI is going to be Uh, Martinez, possibly there is a connection problem. Um, so no worries. Uh, in a moment, we we'll fix that. And I guess, yeah, I guess some connection problem on the side of Martinez is uh, taking place, and, and we'll try to reconnect in a moment. I write to Martinez to see. Um, yeah, and in the meantime. Uh, if anybody wishes to say anything um, or any thoughts so far, it is a good time to have this little break before Martinas reconnects. And... Ah, Peter, would you like to say anything? Yes, uh, well, we got bigger with 25% of the code being accepted. I don't think it translates to 25% of. Uh, productivity or time saved or, or because when you accept something from from co-pilot uh, it's not like you can just leave it there i mean it creates work you, you get code there you need to understand and, and often fix and oh when i look back at the week and i've used co-pilot to check gpt uh, a lot uh and I don't know actually after after that week if I have gained or lost time. 
that's how it feels uh, uh, for me because sometimes it looks very promising at the start and then uh, you have just been like hijacked into to a sidetrack and sometimes it looks not so promising at the start and but it, in the end it was, it was the right way to go so it's it's really hard i think to really measure at least with that kind of metric yeah, thank you for this, Peter. And by the way, Martinas is back, and maybe. Uh, yeah, sorry, I probably yeah. lost you uh, at some point. Where did I lo lost you? Uh, it looks uh, like your connection is a bit weak, so uh, you, you. Uh, but uh, can you hear I us? You? Uh, we were just chatting about about uh, the question about co-pilot and so on. So you didn't miss anything uh, okay. except for Peter's comment. Yeah, so I think I think that uh, I think that Copilot is a nice tool, but if it doesn't produce the licenses, then I agree with the lawsuit. Uh, if they if they poorly, then they are then, then they are then they are creating something that well, the patent patent system is already weird for me because. Because it prevents um, small people like us do, uh, from doing stuff, but uh, it is for them to decide what they want to do with it. Uh, so if, if if some people be revised uh, on what it means. Yeah, uh, thank you, Martinas. By the way, I think there is a slow connection on your side. So what, know, one thing know. we could do is uh, maybe not share the video, uh, just to kind of make it a bit uh, less heavy. And, uh, you know, any processes running or anything like that, uh, or anything like that. No, Carl, I, I need to do the presentation, so... I if it fails, then I'll try to do with that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so any more questions, maybe comments? Uh, then I'll go on. Uh, so yeah, so natural language processing models. Uh, so they, what they do is they process tokens. Uh, their, their purpose is to, uh, to take tokens uh, for example, this hello string, world string, and for example, in some in some types, uh, you could, for example, want to use the dot, or maybe you would like to omit the dot. It depends what you want to do. So they consume it, and then they remember, and they decide what output they have to have. Uh, and this output is decided on your on your training. So you can have a boolean, you can have a list of tokens, or you can have maybe something else. And the thing is that you cannot really use the neural networks uh, the, the same as for, for basic, uh, basic Im image recognition because those neural networks cannot, uh, cannot, um, cannot take uh, unknown, unknown amount of tokens as their inputs. So in that part, they are not properly suitable for the sentences that have different length every time. Also, outputs can have different lengths uh, than input and different lengths uh, entirely uh, than depending on the context. Or maybe it's the same, or maybe it's only always maybe one token, like a boolean or something like that. So in, the, in that case, outputs cannot also, uh, mm, also restrict what models can be used. So neural networks, as we know it, for example, the ones that predict a number or the ones that predict uh, uh, and, for example, take items one by one. Or so first, so before, before we uh, think about how do we parse uh, the inputs, we have to talk about how computer can uh, comprehend a word or understand it. So there are several metrics, several ways of interpreting uh, 
once you have the word in the text, it could be of uh, percentage of the word in the text, uh, maybe occurrences, maybe it could be uh, by, by mm, word tuples, or it could be it could be something else. Uh, it could also be these word embeddings, which map a word, which for example are these words into a vector of different dimensions. This is for, this is used in 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 tools such as Word to Vec, uh, where they have an encoder that encodes a word into some kind of dimensions, in some kind of different dimension uh, space. And in that space, this word can be close together with, uh, with a similar word with similar words of that sort. So for example, in my example here, I have cat and dog, which are kind of close together in here and in zeros are they are the same, but actually the leaf is quite far away. And hammer is also far away from cat and dog. So in this case, we would have a three, no, four day space. Well, actually, it would be simpler just to understand it, like these two variables. Then we would have 2D space where cat would be fluffy and pointy, dog would be this and this, and so on. And it would, they would be either together or far away. And then computer could use some kind of an algorithm to differentiate between these words. So if we input cat walks down the street, then maybe these tokens of of this these vectors, which which are tokens, they will mean something. And this is this is the this is a, this is how the model could work. So let's talk about the LSTMs. I'm not going to go deep into this. Uh, just to mention that there are two ways of model, two ways to model things. So LSTM uh, stands for long short term memory. It has a state. It is like a glorified uh, wrapper around two variables. Uh, when you, uh, the, the point is that you enter a word one by one. So you enter hello, then later you enter a world, then you enter a dot if you need to. And with this LSTM cell, you mutate your memory. And when, when uh, you consume your sequence of words, you produce something. Maybe it will be one token, maybe it will be more tokens. It depends how you connected these cells or different cells, maybe not LSTM cells, together. <coughs> so in this graph, uh, you don't need to understand it fully. Uh, this graph shows how the internal state, which is C and H, these are two internal states, this is the long-term state, and this is the short-term state. And uh, this t minus one signifies time. So this internal state changes from time t minus one to time t. And, and this h also changes from t minus one to t. And in this single iteration, you do some mathematical operations. And what you have to decide is that based on the, net, on the new word, should I forget what I already have, or should I input into this long-term memory, or should I produce uh, from, from long-term memory, or should I produce from the short-term memory? And this is this HD over here, even though they're the same. This is the result of the cell at every iteration. So there is no choice whether we want to produce two results, whether we want to produce five results or one result. There is just one input and one output, and it it is try it, it is actually trying to be very basic, and it's good. But if we want to to do something more flexible, then maybe we cannot have it. So it stores two states. It has to choose if if it's it, if it finds something interesting that it was it wants to store, then it has to either forget or add. It cannot do both. So if uh, I so either a replace operation or a, or uh, take these, for example, two vectors and just add them together and expect that 
you will still have a proper output. But as you, as you have only two variables, you cannot really remember the world. Because if the sequence is too big and everything uh, is very interesting, then you will have to forget. But also, you have to output at basically every step. Even though you don't want to output, you have to output. Maybe you want to just calculate more. You have to output. So these are the kind of a good sides of LSTM because they are not going to take so much memory, but at the same time, they will, um, they will have these drawbacks. A transformer, on the other hand, it uses a different model for storing to the next step. So it just calculates that. And uh, it uses, uh, uses, it, it outputs matrices. So for example, it could be one by something matrices or it could be square matrices or not square matrices. And uh, the most important part of transformer is, and then later we could talk about a parallelization and then concatenation of the self-attention block. So you can understand about you can you can understand multi-head uh, multi-head uh, as ability to parallelize computation. So if you have LSTM cell, you have everything everything that you have is stateful. So there is no way that you can compute half of it on one on one on one core and another half of it on the other core. So if, if we would look into the data that transformer, uh, the transformer uses inside, we have these word embeddings that I gave you an example before that contains a vector of uh, different dimensions of uh, some kind of meanings. And then uh, let's say we have this, the, the K meanings. It could be 10, it could be 500. Uh, it depends on your model. And then let's say we have a matrix. So if we have a matrix of which is square, a square matrix, and then we multiply that at another matrix, well, a vector also could be interpreted as a vector, which has the same dimension uh, as the original vector. So this means that we can do some operations with matrices, and then we could get an output of the same vector. Of the same vector, maybe it could be. And the uh, transformer, they have in the self-attention self block, they have these weight matrices which are actually multiplied with the inputs. And this is how it works. It takes, uh, well, first of all, I have to mention that this is uh, pro probably too much uh, simplified, but in a nutshell, it takes uh, the vectors of word embeddings. It multiplies uh, matrices together, either with a vector. Yeah, first of all, it multiplies it with, with the with the, with the weights, and then it multiplies the results together, and then gets another matrix back. So a list of vectors, because our sentence, for example, could contain five words, and uh, that means that if we would represent our words as, uh, let's say, a vector of five items, then we would, we would be well, no. If we, if our word embedding would have ten dimensions, then we would have ten vectors. Uh, with, no, we would have five words and then 10, 10 items each. So we would have five by ten Okay, so it doesn't need to be square. I just made it square just for example sake. So transformer network doesn't need to use square matrices. 
uh, it is just easier to explain that matrix uh, matrix uh, multiplication uh, can change dimensions and uh, and then change them back every time the and also vector in the opposite way you will get a different result with the different dimensions so it ha they have to be multiplied in a specific order so how is transformer different from LSTM or maybe let's call it how what are the pros and cons so LSTM has two uh, places to store the data RNN has one place uh, and the transformer uses this dot product which produces uh, a, a, basically a square of uh, uh, words to words, which means that when uh, every word is linked to the other, to the same sentence, uh, to the other word in the same sentence, and uh, this is what it means to have attention. Uh, every cell has a probability of, of importance, which word which connection to which word in the same sentence of the input sentence is important. And if we have this dynamic state, it means that theoretically, if we have infinite uh, memory, infinite uh, machine, we could have infinite uh, resources to run anything. And as it is parallelizable, it means that it means that we can actually do it easily. And other stems ah. are none because they could use maybe maybe they could use combined results in some way with maybe even something else. So yeah, I already mentioned it, but it outputs everything into the next step. Anything in in its yes outputs everything into the next uh, step. And uh, when when it does this uh, computation, the the complexity is n squared because this is the amount of work n is the amount of words that you have. So when it produces a square matrix then it says it, it computes every probability of every attention square so it is way more expensive than running lstm that has only two variables uh, which are vectors but they're not that expensive uh, sorry do you have a question uh, i think we did lose you for a little bit. So there was a little bit of a delay because of the connection, but I think we did get most of it. Yeah, so it, it could be a good time for questions if anybody wishes to ask something. Uh, next, I will show you the graph. So I will be able to talk about uh, how to, it goes into, uh, into the architecture of the network. I, I actually had a question. Um, uh, thank you for that explanation. That was pretty clear. I thought. Um, I'm I'm curious about in the um, in the transformer model once you wind up with your matrix of weights, like how do you get that back to actual words that you've returned to? You? Um, I will I will explain it later. Uh, cool. I don't re I don't really know everything every step, but uh, in the next slide I will explain. You'll see the whole network. And then I will try to explain it. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so so then, oh, Peter. Yes, so I wonder when this um, this uh, long term short memory was that the, the oh, word? Yes. Uh, when when is it applied? So my model of this is from talking to chat. GPT. Uh, is LSTM it, is not it is, using uh, just the, GPT. Okay, so it's not using that. It's, it's using that that other kind of. Yeah, this this more complex. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. LSTM is used for machine translation and for a little bit uh, for tasks that are not as uses this uh, transformer model. For a moment, ChatGPT uses this transformer model, which uh, takes input the 
whole sentence at once and it, co it, it can chop it into separate parts and compute it separately and then combine it. Uh, there was another question by John. Hey, yeah, thanks for uh, putting that together. Question about the attention heads. I saw you were describing it mathematically, the matrices, um, but how does that, can you, do you have any intuition about how that might relate to actual attention? Like, how does that work? And how does it, how, how's it analogized to attention? I'm just curious if you if you if you know. I mean, just yeah, kind of yeah. curious. So I I already gave a small example of three <laughs> matrices, and those matrices are three and not for uh, random reason, but there are three because one of them is Q and K and V. So Q is query matrix, key uh, key is key v, K is key matrix, and V is value matrix. So when some of them, when, when these matrices are uh, multiplied with the, with the data in specific way, then they produce another matrices, other matrices which have either zeros or, pro, or values from zero to one inside of them. And that means that it basically selects from your training data. And then when you combine it, then you get a big mate big mm -hmm. then you get a mm, list of, of of these vectors that uh, are produced from your training data it's, it's also so big. that's like the given query context is is being um... something like that but what what i like to think is that it basically filters a whole database at a time because mm -hmm. your training data is your whole database. Right. And then it tries to query it using matrix multiplication. And then it's storing that. Uh, so it kind of took the local context and did a comparison against the whole right. database. And then it stores that context, right? Uh, no, it doesn't. It just outputs it. Uh, and then uh, the output mechanism uh, returns these as words. Because when you when you do sep several layers of these, then you then you get mm, then you then you have several internal states. For example, uh, I heard that in the paper they used six layers. Uh, I'll actually jump into mm -hmm. into the slides. So let's say this is your layer, right? This is the big one, and this is n times. So this big layer can be repeated multiple times. And the input embedding is the vector of vectors. So this is your words. Well, no, actually, actually, this is the input. But yeah, this is the input here. This is the input for training, sorry. So yeah, so the attention heads are working at both uh, training time and inference time, right? right? I'm not really sure. Uh, so this multi-head multi -head attention is over here. So we don't need to think about it because we can run what one head and we can simplify it this way. And when you, when you do the inputs, then they are uh, converted into this vector embeddings. And then these vector embeddings go into this, this if you see here, split. So this split means that uh, they are just taken verbatim over here and then multiplied by your weights. Over here, you have the encoder and here you have the decoder. And in here, uh, when you want to evaluate the model, you enter your words and then in here you convert them into this vectors of, uh, of meaning. So it, they have a lot of dimensions in here. So basically in here, you already have a matrix. When the encoder does their part, uh, this is a little bit different than this. 
In here, you input from the decoder and decoder decides on the value. And in here, you input from the input. And then you can stack a lot of these steps over here. Oh, this step can be stacked uh, for many, many uh, for as many depth and as many in internal layers as you want. And this one can also be stacked. And when they are stacked, uh, only the last uh, only the output from the last layer is going into all of these layers because every layer needs to get this input. But when these are stacked, they are outputting only from the last one, but to all of them, like in in a read. Every only the last layer will output into these. So yeah, and then later. Uh, this is also a trainable layer. So in here you enrich the no, in here you also enrich the data, but in here you convert the uh, the internal representation into something that you can read that the human can read. So that's that's what I wanted to mention. Also, this layer is a little bit different because in here you have this mask. So this mask is applied only for training. This means that you will only be able to see the word that um, that uh, you you have to see, oh, not the future word. So that's it. I don't want uh, to explain more. Um, did I did I lose you or not? I didn't. Great. No, it it was great actually, Martinas. That's a beautiful explanation, I think. Yeah, that made sense. It it sounds like. Um... Yeah, what you're saying is that it's taken the um, the outputs uh, uh, during training and, and and feeding it back into the attention heads. Uh, the outputs yeah. would being the last uh, output neurons. Yeah, oh. very interesting. Thanks. Great. Okay, so what what models do we have right now? So we have a model from Google. We have a model from Microsoft. We have a model from Meta. And at some point, this meta uh, produced model was leaked. And uh, then later, somebody also leaked the weights for it. So now we know that meta has a pretty good model. And then somebody decided to make an optimization of this model so that you could run the 60 billion parameter model on a laptop without GPU. So this is an interesting one. And there are two models that are trained with open data sets. And there, is just, so there are some models that are just for fun and probably more. So I made a map and uh, it shows that you can buy a software as a service uh, model for, of GPT-4 and then you can just try it out or you can use the Google model and GPT-4 but they are not available for download. A Llama model, well, it's leaked, so it's available for download, and it can run. Uh, yeah, it the dumbed down version of Open Llama, Alpaca, and Llama, dumbed down versions of these models, under trained versions, can run on on a laptop. This is basically a laptop, and. Oh, we do. We did lose you now, Martinez, for a moment. Can you hear us? No. Yeah. On a laptop without the GPU. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, do you have any questions, or should I proceed? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, I had a question. Uh, Oh, you, you presented all these different models. Yes. Um, I guess they're all, they all, all use the transformer method. Yeah, uh, these, that, all of them use the transformer method. And then is the, the, are there significant differences like in interacting with, with, with them? Or is it just um, the, the, like how, how you can access them? Than okay. uh, some of them are trained more. Uh, but I, I'm not going to go into details uh, comparing them okay. because I did not research this. Okay, thank uh, you. But I know that GPT models are pretty good. Uh, Google's model is also pretty good. Um, okay. 
but they are op they are a closed source. Um, GPT-4 model is somehow better than GPT-3, but I don't really know how. I did not research this. Uh, my my, I was trying to understand how how this works. <laughs> secret sauce. Yeah. Secret sauce. Well, of course they yeah. can they can add secret sauce all the time. So what yeah. I know is that GPT four can output images, but it is limited. Uh, and uh, no, not GPT four. Sorry, Palm. Google, Google's a. Yeah, and and GPT four can is multimodal. Does images, I think, with a plugin or something. You gotta pay for it. The plus. Um, so Google's model can output images, but I think that those images are not part of the model. I think that they are separately trained, separately gathered, um, because it would probably be too much to store all of the URLs in the model. Uh, that I can say, but other other than that, I did not research the differences between these models. Okay, so okay, if if the model if the models are actually outputting data that we can use as a humans, then probably we don't really need humans at all, and that means that we as a as a race we are not needed, and it probably means that we are. Uh, and we're going to end our existence. So actually, maybe it's, it's not really true. Because if, uh, if I would uh, ask a, an Undertale model about something, then it will not know that. So the models don't really um, gain new information without training. So if I would go into a different screen where I have a, I have a model, and just refresh this and then say, how do I tie a shoe? So this is the demo part already. So this is the 7 billion open llama model, which I can run and I'm running right now on my machine. So I will just start the generation and then I will start the task manager to see what's going on. Yeah, so the output from the model is not really something that you would be able to use it uh, as a human. So even though it outputs a proper, properly formed text, it doesn't really say something meaningful. So this is what undertrained model works, how, how it works. So if, if we say that if, if, if there is a model that is not trained for, for example, for stock investing situations, uh, let's say GPT-3 could be not trained for that, then it means that whatever you ask from that model is going to be, uh, it's a guess. it could be a guess, it could be, it could be maybe something reasonable, but you will not be able to tell because this model just said to me that, um, why do I need to, to find the shoelaces? What do I need to do with them? So it is not really useful. It's telling you to tie your shoes to a leg or a stool. Yeah, it says that tie to ends around something. But OK, actually, this is not a very easy prompt. But if I go, uh, for example, to uh, a model that is uh, more trained more for example if i go to chat gpt and try to ask the same questions um and maybe it can respond better than gps the model it's very very more, hard <laughs> ask them the same questions and this model uses the presentation. It will it will not use all the RAM. And if it uses all the RAM, then it will then it will be able to use some swap. But well, 
Let's see what it does. Because uh, while we wait for ChatGPT, well, okay, ChatGPT doesn't have problem, but it's it's really trained very very much. Yeah, Martina, that is so enlightening. By the way, we are now around the official time, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe it makes sense to continue a little bit to conclude a few of the parts that you're okay. hoping to tell. And then we can come back to anything in the future and tell more and discuss it more. And, and after Martina's, uh, after the talk ends, then we'll have a discussion for those who can stay. And yeah, what do you think, Martina? Where should we oh. go now? I don't really have a proper conclusion. I just wanted to say thanks for organizing this and thanks to for help and to, to for reviews of my slides and uh, for organizing uh, uh, this all of these events. So yeah, and what I want to say is that I also have more uh, more demos. So this is my only the first demo I have prepared several models uh, which I could demonstrate. But uh, I will not be running this 30 billion model uh, again because even though it is so even though it is because it is not trained for this um, I saw the internet go what, what matters is what they are trained for. Yeah. So I just, yeah. I, I think that is, there is no point of waiting what, when it is will, when it will complete, because it it outputs some. Well, it is not something that you. So okay, cross the um, where we have text text sentiment analysis. So let's say we have this tweet, and then we have this tweet, and then we have another tweet. And we say that this tweet has a negative sentiment, and this one has a positive, and so on. So if I enter, for example, eating something is good, I eat la la la, then it will allow me to understand that it will allow, it will it will mark the tweet either as positive, neutral, or negative. And I actually can push it for push it harder by saying that okay, this is like uh, going to be feelings. Uh, this will be feelings, and uh, this is going to be logical facts. Sometimes people say facts or facts or feelings, so we can we can do also analysis which doesn't produce only the good bad uh, thing about text but we can actually do more and not, maybe not even do the good bad but we can produce more but, but here uh, it is not uh, it is not uh, replying with what we said it to reply so we can actually force them to reply in in our book our like enumeration. Um, I did not try this, but we should be able to do this. So as you see here, I have not been able to force them to, to think about this, but with this with some fiddling, I know that this is possible to do because this is the same kind of dimension that our text has. 
and this hat. <clears throat> and uh, when when you give the model uh, several examples, then it can actually return <coughs> and it can actually return what you asked them to do. Uh, what I know that will work is that if I will remove the second sentence, then it will produce a proper one. Here, so facts. So eating vegetables is good for health. So then it will pro then it produce the fact. But what I wanted to do here was to force them to use one of these words. But it is a little bit harder to do. So for the second demo, uh, by uh, the way, uh, I think Peter has a comment, and maybe it makes sense. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for for this. Uh, so sorry about the technical trouble, but uh, this is super super interesting. Uh, I was thinking about this thing you try to like force it to to do. Um, I've heard like a term being thrown around, like forced alignment. Is mm -hmm. that is that this? Um, no, I'm not sure. I, I cannot I cannot mm -hmm. comment on this. Uh, first alignment, I heard this and when I was reading about uh, the jailbreaking part of the models, So when I heard about this force alignment, it was uh, this uh, whisper model for, uh, for timing of uh, spoken, spoken text and uh, how this whisper X model had more of the force alignment. So, so it could reduce the hallucinations and and um, got more accurate GPT in, four and in you are GPT three and comply, they would be aligned. So alignment of, uh, um, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so if we go back um, to the demo, we could uh, do yeah. Let's do the let's do the hacking. Oh yeah, let's let's first do a generation. So if I take this sentence, it will be a more interesting example. So let's say. I want to generate a CV for a software engineer. And I want that CV. Uh, and, and then let's say I will take that CV and generate a second CV, which is not related. Maybe it's related uh, for a Scrum Master. And then we will take those two people and generate a LinkedIn recommendation from one to another, because this is what they do people write recommendations. So let's write one for soft Scrum Master. Okay, so if you see here, it starts to generate so that it would uh, uh, output other companies and so on, but example, and I'm not trying to be, I have tried this prompt me. Great. Uh, now uh, I could either do um, I could either do the recommendation generation immediately, or I could do I could just generate like for example several points uh, where these two people could have worked together. So if I will try to generate it immediately, maybe it will not be good. So let's say uh, generate um, LinkedIn recommendation um, to, to the Scrum Master. Let's try it, whatever it is. Um,
as we play this. So we generated, um, okay. <coughs> Maybe the term oh. is in endorsement or something like that. No, no, uh, the term is good. Uh, the problem is that it has to scan the CVs and it has to compare them. So it is, uh, it is a task that it cannot really do that uh, that easily probably maybe they can do it uh, on themselves they could do it later but uh, there is one step that will make this very very easy so what 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 the, pro the problem was that uh, it didn't think about the companies from the cvs it didn't it, it didn't even consider them so even though it is they did not consider uh, one more step and then they could generate this uh, five points where I could uh, have for this one. <clears throat> awesome. So now the model tries to take the actual CVs and, uh, and produce the outputs. But what it didn't mention was the company names. Mm. So I will try to uh, let's let's try to also include some details <clears throat> here. So X Y Z and A B C now they are com they are coming in. So what this means is that now we will be able to use these outputs as our blueprint. So now let's try to generate the same stuff that we were trying to do before. Mm. Here, I will copy the same. But now I will change it. Blah, blah, blah. Right. Let's try to do this. Oh, well, I think that this is the garbage part. Um, okay, it doesn't say that the company is there. Probably my prompt is actually bad. this way. I'll, I tried to mention that and this time it could work. By the way, Martinas, that is great. And maybe in a moment it makes sense to uh, leave the demos part and have some discussion. So yeah, let course. us think. If, we could if, do a discussion uh, while it is thinking. Yeah, great. And, and uh, you know, Martinas, I did get this clear sense that I wish to hear you speaking again and there is so much more to tell so I'm, I'm you know I'm hoping that you you will agree to give another talk in the future and thank you so much for this and um yeah so some a, a few people are still here and a few people have joined while you were speaking and maybe it makes sense to go through to, to you know to pass to the discussion path so, Martinez, do you have any like any concluding remarks before we kind of conclude this part? And maybe, yeah, and we can keep the demo running uh, while we have the discussion, as you said. So, do you wish to say anything before we kind of conclude this part? No, oh, I think that uh, language models are great uh, for what they are trained for. But if they are not trained for, uh, uh, let's say, investing in stock markets, then People are going to try to use them there, but they
this conception is that, hey, if I don't, I think that this has been that a, I think that this is a great. Yeah, we, we did lose you for a minute, uh, but I oh, think, uh, yeah, hopefully, but I think we did get like the, the kind of the main comments. Uh, yeah, but... I think that it's a good technology, but if, if people are going to use it mindlessly, like for stock investing, which is not trained for, then it, there is no, well, we cannot stop the people from using it that way. But if they are going to try to use it, then it's on them. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. If it's not trained, it's, if your model is not trained for your task, then it's not going to be useful there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, Martinez, thank you so much. And maybe now we we can uh, kind of think together. And um, John, I think you did have a few comments earlier. And maybe John, if it makes sense, would you like to kind of talk a little bit about the channel you're running and about that effort, which is maybe not visible to everybody, but it's actually so exciting. So yeah, would you like to tell yeah. a little bit, John? Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a new channel, Closure LLM, no underscores, no dashes, just Closure LLM on Closurians. Um, and um, pretty cool uh, fellow named Rupert kind of uh, is leading the charge there on um, uh, kind of like trying to build out a, a closure chatbot, a closure coding assistant. And, um, you know, we may or may not get there and it's a, it's a big thing. It's a big, it's a hard thing to do, um, but it's a cool thing for community effort. And it's got a, a lot of different moving parts, obviously, to build a chat bot. Um, there's one thing out there called Fopilot, which is like Copilot, which uh, provides a lot of the infrastructure to, you know, host kind of like an LSP kind of thing for your Copilot. Um, so we may, if we get to a model that is good at closure, um, may use that to try to host a, um, Copilot like service for closure, but um, yeah, a lot of moving parts and the parts that I'm focusing on right now are uh, just getting the data. So it's not gonna work unless we can get the data, enough data to where, um, you know, we fine tune it and um, it, can, it, can, it can help us out. So um, I just knocked out the uh, first draft, first rough, copy of a scrape of the closure email list pretty naive take at it on it first right now um you know there's it's just very simplistic and only is taking those email threads that are um short because the longer ones i can't really uh, correlate um the replies very accurately and, and really we only want replies that are code associated with the code. And uh, eventually we may want to use an LLM to, for, for classification of these, some of these data sets and um, that will help them out. But if anybody wants to help out, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of data sets out there to include um, the Clojurians Slack archive. Um, that's quite a few messages. Um, we would need to have a discussion on how to go about um, clustering those messages automatically into threads and and then um, uh, question answer pairs. Um, so it's a non-trivial task there to, to, to try to go about. So some of the messages in the archive for Clojurians Slack are obviously correlated. There's, there's uh, when someone responds in a, a thread manner, uh, that is captured as a thread, but sometimes people don't respond that way. When someone uh, at someone else, that's clearly can be uh, organized into a thread-like manner, but um, sometimes people are talking free form in the channel and it's not clear uh, statistically that there's a thread going on. So it's kind of hard we'll have to figure that part out. Another huge, uh, Data set I think that we're going to want to use for the closure LLM is uh, synthetically generated data. So that just means like actually synthetically generating closure functions, and um, and actually maybe even synthetically generating um, 
conversations around closure code. Um, and of course, chat GPT or GPT-4 is best at that currently um, for, for generating conversations like that. But we, as far as I understand, we can't use chat GPT or open AI's services to output uh, content for the training of our model if we want it to be commercially usable. So I'm not going to go down the road of using chat GPT or open AI stuff to, uh, to generate any um, training material. Uh, but we could potentially like use tools like closure spec or just string manipulation to build closure forms and, uh, and then just run them through a REPL and get lots of output for millions and millions of forms and uh, and then use that as as training pairs to give uh, the to fine tune as a fine tuning um, training pairs to give it some uh, intuition around how at least the closure compiler um, will react to the various things. So I think that's a really like actually like some low hanging fruit. Uh, I, I'm not yet sure how to go about um, building out synthetic closure data for for building out lots of uh, repling interactions, for instance. But I think that that would be a great conversation to have, and uh, I think that you know, yeah, there's a, a lot of green field out there for synthetic synthetic uh, training data. For uh, we guys think about that. You have any comments? Um, that does seem like a cool idea to me, uh, at least like getting the, uh, uh, doing the spec to generate forms and then seeing what the actual REPL gives back. I'm a little more, I'm not sure about uh, like chat GPT. I feel like training a data on output from another model. I'm not, to, to me, that kind of triggers my like garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, indeed. Um... Yeah, you know, I think, and let me push back on that a little bit. Um, this idea of garbage in, garbage out in terms of using another, um, there are entire models out there that are trained purely on uh, just output from uh, ChatGPT, and, and those are actually pretty good. In fact, you can dial in, um, and it, kind of what it is, it's, it's almost like building a fuzzy, model you're, you're you're generating real semantic uh, you know real semantic relations because it's not putting stuff that semantically makes sense but it's also adding a bunch of fuzz of of random human text that um we actually need um and yeah if it's putting yeah i agree that if it's putting out garbage then um like it's actually meaningless but, but I, th I think, from what I understand, it's being used successfully um, to train models of the synthetic data. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to poo-poo the idea because it, it does sound pretty interesting. Like, I guess I'm worried, yeah. like, if the chat GPT data contains hallucinations, then you're kind of you're reifying those hallucinations, and you're, kind yeah. of, you know, what I mean? Like, you're you're sort of saying like this hallucination is an actual fact. Like no, mm -hmm. it, yeah. But what I want, what, what I want to accomplish is, um, you know, a, a, just a, a sentence. How do I? Is this the right way to do a Fibonacci sequence? And then there's some piece of code that is broken with respect to Fibonacci sequence, and uh, and then there's an answer, which is the correct Fibonacci sequence, with some other sentence around. No, you want to do it this way. And what I want is that same thing, but ten times. But each t each time the sentence structure is slightly different. And, and that way uh, we have 10 examples of um, noisy stuff. And, and so, you know, um, that noise is going to be a little bit of garbage. We want that to be garbage so that it can distinguish the, you know, among a bunch of garbage, you know, this is the wrong code and this is the right code. Here's an idea I've been thinking of too. Um, you know, we have all these examples of um, from foreclosure, examples of people giving answers to foreclosure problems. Um, what we can do is we can take the, you know thousands of those examples and then generate uh, conversational, uh, take 
any working example we know of, and then just remove one parentheses from it, and then run it through the, uh, the, the, the REPL. And then the REPL will have, a, you know, some broken output because we're missing a parentheses. But we already know that beforehand. So then we generate uh, some output saying uh, some smart Oracle closure uh, um, bot saying you're missing a parentheses here. And, you know, a few thousand of those and we'll have a bot that really knows how to, you know, tell you where you're missing your parentheses. So if we can generate thousands of those where we already know the outcome beforehand, um, then it's it's a little bit easy. We don't actually need a LLM to generate all of those cases for us. We can just know certain failure modes beforehand and then generate a thousand of those failure modes. Does that make sense? Uh, John, I'll stop you for a moment. That is great. And maybe in a moment we can dive in more into that. Uh, by the way, we are still recording. So maybe uh, somebody may wish to say anything before we stop recording and then we can keep going maybe more freely with no recording going on. And so I think, Dominda, did you wish to say anything? Um, uh, a, a few minutes ago, I think, or maybe. So, uh, sorry, Daniel. Yeah, I thought I had something, but I'll ask it, ask it at the end. It's fine. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So if there aren't any other comments before we stop the recording, then in a moment we can say goodbye to the recording. But then that just keep going for those who can stay a little longer. And thank you, everybody, for the very late hour on some countries. So late. And thank you for being here, actually. And uh, yeah, so we are saying goodbye and see you on the next times. And now we'll keep chatting. <laughs>